todos, bienvenidos a este ciclo de charlas del de Centro de Estudios de Historia Económica de la USEMA. Hoy tenemos como invitado al doctor Richard McGaha, profesor de Historia Militar, actualmente es profesor en la Universidad de Seattle, en, en Estados Unidos. Eh, esta charla quiero advertir que eh, va a ser eh, totalmente en inglés, Lamento que no podamos tener eh, traductores, pero no tenemos, no tenemos presupuesto para traductores, así que eh, a partir de ahora vamos a, vamos a básicamente hablar únicamente eh, en inglés. Richard, welcome to USEMA. Thank you, Emilio. Thank you for having me. Good. Let me make a, a, a few comments about your background and, and why I decided to invite you uh, to this, uh, to this uh, seminar that we're hosting at USEMA. Uh, first, so that our audience uh, understands, uh, uh, Richard Magaha is a military historian. Uh, he has focused on mostly European history and uh, German uh, military history. And interestingly, uh, and the reason why I decided to invite him today is because he wrote a very interesting PhD thesis back in 2009. Uh, he was a student of Norman Goda, who is an expert on Nazism and German uh, history as well. And the quality of the uh, thesis that Professor Magaha wrote is, is outstanding and is the kind of uh, quality that we would expect from historians because he's basically done his homework and he did research uh, with uh, primary documents in, in German archives, in British archives, and also in American archives. So um, Richard, before we go on, um, Have you ever been in Argentina, by the way? No. Oh, I have not. I, I've, okay. I have wanted to come. I, I, I kept hoping <laughs> I could actually do, uh, do research down there, but it just didn't uh, pan out. Well, that, that's what, the, the reason I ask you is, that why did you, uh, you were at uh, Ohio University, yes. uh, you were a PhD candidate, and what drove you to write something about Argentina Uh, 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 this this topic of Nazi espionage in in Argentina during the Second World War, actually before the Second World War, what, what what was the reason why you decided to pick this topic? Well, the short answer is my supervisor. Um, when I showed up, um, I had left uh, the uh, master's program at Calgary, and I had written my master's thesis on Karl Haushofer, the great geopolitician and very controversial. And I had planned on writing an intellectual biography of Haushofer, con continuing on with that. Well, no, um, Norm Goda was part of the Nazi war crimes, Imperial Japanese government interagency working group, which was working on declassifying all the World War II files. And so he had gone through all this stuff and he had um, just mentioned it to me, he's like, I, I, I was going through these files and I, and I found this file that was really interesting. Um, you know, they were threatening this guy with torture. Why don't you take a look at it? And of course it was Osmer Helmut's file. And I was like, well, this is really interesting. And it sounds, it more, sounds like a movie. Yes. And the more I started digging into it, the more interest, the, I mean, the, the, the characters just, I mean, you, you can't make these people up. I mean, you know, you know, Johannes Siegfried Becker with with the long fingernails. And, and I mean, and, and he's just this womanizer. I mean, he has he has women everywhere. You know, he gets the wife of a Brazilian cabinet minister pregnant. It's I'm like, I'm like, I have to write about this. So you found you found uh, that this was very exotic. You know, in this part of the world, uh, reality always trumps fiction. Yeah. So. You know, uh, I'm not surprised, uh, but you 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 miss the 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 element of the the, the real Argentine. So so Professor Goda basically goaded you into mm. write this thesis. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what were you? Because your thesis has many different elements to it. And by the mm. way, I want to uh, tell the audience that uh, you can download 
this uh, thesis from the internet. If you go into Google and you put uh, Richard Magaha and the politics of Nazi espionage in, in Argentina, you will find the link uh, from Ohio University and you can download it and read it. It's 400 pages long and it's full of uh, uh, very useful and interesting uh, material. So tell us a little bit about the, the main objective uh, you had when 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 you wrote uh, this this thesis? Well, I mean, I guess the main question I had was like, what are the Nazis up to here? I, it, there there had been research that had been done um, by by others, and and I do recommend the book by by, by uh, um, uh, Leslie Roud and John Bratzel, um, which which I think is is quite well done. Um, the That's a 90s, uh, 1970s book, right? It's uh, 1980s. 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 But but a lot of what they did I, holds up really well. I, I I was really I met John Bratzel at a conference and 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 a lot of his a lot of their conclusions hold up really well. They do miss a lot of the stuff partly because the classification of the documents, the stuff I was working with was really declassified. Like when it came to Becker, you know Becker Becker was Becker had had an interview with the Argentine Federal Police. That was given. To well, let, let me interrupt you right there because okay. I'm not sure our uh, audience is totally familiar with the character. So okay. we have to introduce sure. them sure, no problem. Uh, a little bit more gradually. Okay. But uh, so that everybody knows, Sigrid Fe uh, Becker, uh, uh, also known as uh, Sargo, uh, was the leading agent that, the, that Himmler's SS had in South America. And he was in charge of the entire network of uh, espionage throughout the Americas, not only in Argentina, but throughout the Americas. And uh, he was a very capable agent. So that, that's Siegfried, Siegfried uh, Becker, also known as Panadero as well. Um, and, and he's the man uh, Richard was referring to earlier as being a, a very interesting character. So okay. continue please about Becker. Okay. Okay. So, um, I forget where I where I, where I had left off. No, you you were talking about um, the, the 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 structure of your thesis and oh, the different okay. characters. Yeah. yeah. So 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 you know, Becker is obviously sort of becomes one of the main characters here um, in this whole thing, and and I mean, like I said, he's he's just this this fascinating individual. I mean, he. He's able to manipulate people. He he seems to be very charismatic, you know, not, not just from 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 having. I mean, a lot of women help him evade the the the, the federal police. Um, and and again, you know, I was talking about Les Rout and John Bratzel. I mean, they they only had the interview that Becker had done with the Argentine federal police, which, in many ways, is 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 a very creative mix of, of fiction and and nonfiction. And they and it told the story. Realism. Yes, it told the story that that the Argentines and Becker wanted to tell. And but once I got in there, I realized that you know there's a whole different sort of story that's going on here. Um, once you start reading the interviews of of his of his boss, a man named Theodore Pavkin, who who is another sort of interesting character, completely and totally unqualified for his job. <laughs> but he gets it because he's he's loyal to his boss, who's the head of SS Foreign Intelligence, Walter Schellenberg. And then, of course, the gentleman who's working under him, who's Becker's immediate boss, is a guy named Kurt Gross. And and Kurt Gross is sort of one of those creatures who, who, who really just would thrive in any sort of authoritarian system. He's completely sort of amoral. He's apolitical. Um, you know, he told the secretary, a woman named Hedvig Zomer, that, that he goes, you know, if I hadn't been a Nazi, I probably would have been a communist. And, and, and just, you know, he, he, he strong arms his subordinates in, into uh, uh, bringing him uh, luxury goods from overseas. A man named Carl Arnold, who's the head of SS Foreign Intelligence for Spain, is constantly complaining about gross. They have a, a saying for it. They call it uh, uh, grosseria, you know, the, 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 so, so it's that pun on his name. So, so yeah, it was just the, these fascinating characters. But, but let me ask you, because you, you had started and I interrupted you about the previous work that had been done. And I think it's very important for our audience because 
There's a lot of material about Nazi activities in Argentina, and we can very easily divide it into works written by journalists in Argentina mm -hmm. and then works written by foreign historians. Mm -hmm. And they don't actually, you know, sometimes they, they have different approaches. They use different sources. Right. You mentioned this book by John Brussel and, and the other fellow who I can't remember his name. Uh, and then in your book, you mentioned Ronald Newton uh, yes. as another uh, uh, author. Of what, yes. what, you know, he, he wrote yeah. this, this, this important book in which he said that the Nazi menace in Latin America, in particular in Argentina, was completely overblown and that it was sort of a fantasy and it was used uh, politically by, by the Brits and the Americans and whatever. And you have your opinion about that. And then you mentioned also Ukigoni, who is an Argentine. Yes. Tell and us about. I, I mean, I, I think I, I, I mean, you know, uh, Ukigoni. I, I, I he, to me, he, he really is out to get Perón. I mean, he just kind of seems to be that he wants to prove that Perón is a Nazi, and, and that Perón is in bed with the Nazis. And and I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Disagree with that. Um, but at the same time, I, I think the evidence is, is a little more slippery. I mean, Perone was, was, was very sure to make, make sure that his name didn't appear on anything that it didn't want to. And so I, I think he just takes the evidence a little too far. Perone, ultimately, uh, from my perspective, at the end of the day, he's a nationalist. Um, you know, yeah, he has fascist leanings. He admires some of the things about the fascists. But I, I think Goni just just takes these things way too far. But you know, but the bottom the line, back it up. The, the bottom line, and I think the, the, the important thing is that you're the first researcher who had access to the classified information. So yes. your work, in a way, is the work that has the most complete picture from an archival research perspective. And so you yeah. were able to contrast the findings of your own research with these previous books, Newton's books, Brazil's, Goni's, whatever. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and you have sources that uh, some of them never even saw. So that, that, is, that is an important element of, 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 your, of your thesis. And I think, I think that that's what makes it uh, so valuable. I think uh, sometimes in Argentina, uh, we have people who write about history and they never actually step on a, uh, an archive and they've never seen actual uh, real documents. So um, it's very important, you know, that uh, to get instilled into people that read about history that, you, you know, you need, to, you need to follow historians like yourself who actually do the homework, which, you know, it is basically going to, to the archives. Yeah. But for the benefit of our audience, which is not necessarily uh, an audience that, uh, you know, is composed of graduate students, uh, it's open to the public, so we have all sorts of people. It, it may be worth uh, talking a little bit, go back a little bit, and if you could maybe explain first, what is, Nazi espionage in Argentina. Why do the Nazis have espionage and counter espionage activities in Argentina? And how does that connect with the structure, the bureaucratic structure of the Third Reich? And, and you title your um, thesis, The Politics of Espionage. So there's an element of, there was in Germany different agencies. So can you give us some background of first, how did Hitler and the Germans view Argentina in a global picture? And how do this whole uh, spying uh, fits into that picture? Okay. Um, well, first, I, I mean, how, how, does it, how does it fit within the global picture of Nazi? I mean, it doesn't really. I, 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 Hitler is very Eurocentric in his views. I mean, he, he doesn't really have any opinions on Argentina. I mean, he, he deals with these problems if he has to. I mean, he does meet with the Argentine ambassador in 1939 after the Patagonia plot to sort of sit there and say, look, we're, we're not interested in, in, in any territory in Argentina. Okay, but, but he, he never sits there. there. There's no real sort of guidance that comes out of this. From, from what I can tell, especially getting into the economic records, 
that at least in the night from from Germany, Nazi Germany's policy towards Argentina is the same as 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 Weimar Germany's is the same as Wilhelmine Germany's, which is primarily economic. And and I was surprised given that that how large the German population was in Argentina. So so there's the there's the economic ties that are there. There's the cultural ties that are there, and, and those sorts of things. So, so, so the policy is is really just kind of a continuation. Um, how how does it become a base for Nazi espionage? Simply by accident, because Argentina was not even considered as a base. Brazil was going to be the base for everything. Um, they they thought Hatulio Vargas was 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 not going to throw his lot in with the Allies that that he would never break relations, and they had sort of put a lot of their eggs into the Brazilian basket, and so when Brazil finally does break relations and and, and they roll up all the networks, they're they're forced to sort of retrench in in, in Argentina, in Argentina uh, they it, find it, a little this... bit more friendly territory. Sorry to interrupt, but this is very important because. If you went back, and, and you and I were talking the other day, but if you were back to 1938 uh, and you're Hitler and you know you're going to war in Germany and you think about, okay, I don't care much about Latin America, but who is my natural ally in Latin America? The answer would have been Brazil. And four, four years later, uh, it turns out that Brazil is aligned with the U.S. and Argentina is aligned with, with Germany in a way under a false pretense of neutrality. So... Yes. Please go on about the, you know, how it fits with the Third Reich structure and, and everything else. Right. So, so I mean, so, so when war breaks out, I mean, everybody is kind of, kind of scrambling, because even, even the, 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 the German naval attaché in Argentina, who also covers Brazil as well, he covers most of, most of uh, uh, South America. You know, he works for the Abwehr, which is the German sort of military counterintelligence organization. He has to sort of set everything up. Um, and, and, and try to get everything together. And, and so, so it's all done very sort of, you know, on the fly. It, 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 they're making it up as they go along. And, and the people that they pick to, to take part in these organizations are not the most reliable people. None of them are trained. Most of them are businessmen. There's a few that are, that are some, you know, criminals. There's one guy who, who carries a gun around all the time. Um, and even even the the naval attaché is a little disturbed by him the fact that this guy always carries a gun, um, and 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 so so this is this is sort of what they're they're sort of stuck with and left with to 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 try to put this together and and Argentina by default sort of becomes the 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 base of operations and and they do operate out of Chile for a while until until Chile finally decides to throw its lot in with with the Americans. Um, but uh, the one thing I found funny about about Chile, I, I just wanted to add this as a sort of an aside. The one thing I found interesting about Chile was is that they're very upfront about where they're at. When the Americans come to them in 1942 about aligning with them, they look and they say, "Your fleet's at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. You you can't protect us." And they tell the Germans, they're kind of like, "Yeah, we're just." You know, they, they tell everybody the truth. They're like, "We're just kind of waiting around to see which way the wind blows." And so, so it's not really a big surprise when, when, the, when the Chileans throw their lot in with, with the Allies. Now, you, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned the Aber, and the Aber was the military intelligence unit. So it was, yes. it was the uh, Wehrmacht uh, military intelligence unit. And they, were, they had their own people here in Argentina. But, you know, it's very interesting. You mentioned this. Argentina sort of becomes, by accident, sort of the natural place or the natural base for, for Nazi espionage activities, but Nazi espionage activities are carried out through different channels. And the ABBA is, which is led by Admiral Canaris, who is a, a very interesting character, but yes. that, that he deserves a completely different conversation. Yes, uh, we can do a whole but thing. There are other units. Can you explain how the ABBA uh, integrates or doesn't integrate or communicate with uh, uh, Himmler's SS and what happens with the foreign okay. ministries. So you had, you had mentioned earlier about sort of the politics of this. This is part of where the politics come in. 
because um, the the Reich Security Main Agency, which which covers SS Foreign Intelligence and the Gestapo and sort of how we think of sort of the Nazi sort of thing, is is headed by a man named Reinhard Heydrich. And and Heydrich and and Canaris actually knew each other back back. They're friends. They actually live next door to each other in Berlin. They ride horses every day. But Heydrich wants to take over the Abwehr. He wants to be, he wants to get rid of Canaris and, and his people. And so the, they're very much these bureaucratic rivals. And, and so they're, throughout the 1930s, they, they kind of keep butting heads with each other. And then finally, they, they end up at a, at, a, at a meeting together and they come up with what they call the Ten Commandments. And so this is where they delineate all their responsibilities. Okay, we're uh, going to do uh, this. Heydrich, sorry, Heydrich reports to Himmler. Yes, and Himmler he, is one of the key uh, figures in, in the top hierarchy of the Third right. Reich. So we have Hitler, we have Himmler, right. we have Heydrich, Heydrich. And then right. under Heydrich, we have Schellenberg, Walter Schellenberg. Right. Right. So, so, um, so, so the responsibilities are delineated. And basically what it comes down to is, is that SS Foreign Intelligence will be responsible for political reporting. And the Obwehr will be responsible for military and economic reporting. And so those, so those are the two sort of areas where, where they look at. In fact, in 1939, when, when the war breaks out, the, the first thing Dietrich Niebuhr does is, is he starts sending ship, ship reports to, 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 to back to Germany for the U-boats. These are the ships that are leaving Buenos Aires Harbor. In fact, the, the German embassy looks over, overlooks the harbor. So Niebuhr just has to look out his window and he can see which ships are coming and going. And plus the lists are there. So it's not very difficult work for him. Um, and what about the foreign ministry? What does uh, the foreign ministry do in all this? Well, the foreign ministry kind of, kind of gives Niebuhr cover. I mean, he's the naval attache, which most people know attaches are official spies. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so, but, but the, the ambassador who himself is, is, is a really interesting figure, uh, ambassador Termon, he'd been there since 1933. He speaks Spanish. He's very well connected. Um, and, and he's more concerned with protecting his prerogatives and, and, and the foreign ministry, because if, 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 if Heydrich wants to take the Abwehr and subsume it into the SS, Schellenberg wants to become the foreign minister. And Schellenberg sort of sees the, 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 the SS sort of as the future of this and, and his organization is a way for him to be able to do that. And he spends, and once he takes over, he doesn't take over until um, 1941, but once he takes over, he spends so much time trying to get rid of, of, of uh, the foreign minister, von Ribbentrop. And, and spends a lot of time doing that. I mean, there's there's multiple like little um, things that goes on. He 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 gets one of his subordinates to try to uh, put a coup against him, and that fails. And 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 so um, so there's all this this palace intrigue sort of going on. People sort of jockeying for position, and that carries over into Argentina. And and when I started doing my research and I'm reading all this and it, cause if you just look at it on its own, everybody thinks, oh, okay, intelligence gathering, right? This, this is what we're doing. This is what the CIA does. This is what the FBI does. This is what intelligence agencies do. But then you start looking at all the stuff that the Nazis are doing and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Why are they doing this? And it, it took me a while to figure this out. And there's another district, there's another district that was published as a, as a book by Katrin Paler about Walter Schellenberg. And if you look at it through, through the ideological lens of Nazism and Schellenberg's ambitions, then everything starts to make sense. This isn't done for the betterment of Germany. This is done for the betterment of Schellenberg's career. And then it's sort of like, ah, okay, now I understand why they're having all these harebrained schemes. And, and, and then, you, then that, after that, then everything sort of starts to fall into place. Because I, I spent, you don't know how much time I spent trying to figure this out. I'm like, why are they doing this? Why do they put up with this? And ultimately, it comes down to loyalty. You know, I mean, Pavkin is incompetent at his job, but he's loyal to Schellenberg. So that so let's makes it perfect. Review, let's review the chain, okay. the chain of okay. command so that Sorry. people... So we so, have... Okay. 
Bloomberg sitting in Berlin and he runs the counter-espionage unit of the SS, Gestapo. Well, he runs that, you're right, the SS Foreign Intelligence, which is actually different from the Gestapo. The Gestapo yeah, is more... The foreign Intelligence, AMT-6 or something. Yes, up, and, up six, yes. And, and below him is uh, Fagan, who you mentioned. Pa yeah, Theodore Pavkin and then Kurt Gross. And then is, Argentina arrives, yes. uh, uh, I think he first arrives in Argentina in 1941, is Siegfried, Siegfried uh, Becker who, who... Yes, yes. Well, he was there in 1939 when the war breaks out. And that, that's a murky thing because there's a question of whether he was actually working for SS Foreign Intelligence before the war. Um, I think he probably was. He was, was. A high -ranking, he was a high ranking officer within the... He was, he was right? a captain. He was a, a captain. captain. Yeah, he was a captain. The most so senior that, guy, he was the most senior guy on the ground in Argentina. Yes. yes. And so when war breaks out, he, he, he makes his way back to Germany and, and, and he does it very well. I mean, he, he, he gets, he ends up with a false passport, which of course, if, if you're not involved in anything, how do you get a false passport? Um, and, and he smuggles himself past the British blockade back to back to, to, to Nazi Germany and, and once he gets there, they look at him and they say, you're our guy in Argentina, you're gonna head all of our operations there. Go back. And he just, yeah, he just like walked in, yeah, good luck. He just walks in the door. And so they, so what do they do? They send him back. And of course it's easier to get back now because he uh, he he now has a has a passport. They can book him on 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 transport to Brazil through the through the through the air. He doesn't have to uh, uh, smuggle himself back. And he goes with this guy his, whose name is uh, Heinz Lange, who's his supposed subordinate. And of course, once he gets there, Lange sort of looks at him and says, "See you later. Uh, I'm going to go do my thing." And 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 Becker um, makes his way to to Argentina. And he shows up at the embassy with a couple of uh, uh, crates. And the ambassador looks at the packing list and the packing list doesn't mention any crates. It mentions suitcases. And so he asks Becker, he's like, why, why do you have these two crates? And Becker, you know, kind of hymns and haws back and forth and then everything else. And finally, Terramon makes him open up, the, open up the thing and there's explosives in there. Wow. And so... Well, one of the agreements that they had was was that no 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 sabotage was to be conducted in Argentina, and and the SS had actually agreed with this because the the foreign office was like, look, if you start sinking ships in the harbor, they're going to blame us and and it's going to be a disaster. And everybody agreed that that was a good idea. But Becker shows up with these explosives that are meant to sink ships in the harbor, and so he makes them throw it in the river to get rid of all this stuff. And then of course there's a whole back and forth about this um you know i'm sorry you found each other. you you found about this uh, situation in the german archives right yes in the german archives yeah there's a whole there's actually two files that are in german called uh uh tragen becker nach sudamerica so you know becker's sojourn in south america basically and 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 everything is sort of in there laid out and you have the memos back and forth between them and the ss where the foreign ministry is basically telling the SS, you violated this agreement. You, you sent Becker there with all these explosives. And they're like, wait a minute, hold on a second. We didn't know anything about this. That was, you know, we're not, you know, and it's just like, so, you know, ultimately at the end, it's bygones be bygones. So we have Becker responding to Schellenberg. Then we have agents that respond to Canaris uh, yes. within the Aber group. And who are those? Right. Um, so... So the, the, the main person for them is originally Dietrich Niebuhr, the, the naval attache. He's the one who sort of sets everything up. And, and again, I mean, there's not really a whole lot for him to do. It's just more, um, you know, reporting on shipping and reporting on these other things. I mean, he, he has these radio networks set up, but they're not really getting anywhere. I mean, they, 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 it's just not. I don't, I mean, you know, one can make the thing, you know, Niebuhr's not really into his job or he just has incompetent people under him, probably both. Um, and, and so, so, but one thing they make clear to Becker is, is that like the embassy and, and the Abwehr, we don't want anything to do with you. You're going to go do your thing. You go do your thing. 
So don't yeah. mix up with the embassy people, basically. Okay, that's so there's there's the ambassador Termon, there's the charge um, um, Otto Minen, and then um, there's the uh, naval attaché Dietrich Niebuhr, and then there's other people underneath them who are sort of these minor characters who sort of come in and out. But then there's a change, the change of guards at the end of, uh, what is it, 40, in 42, that Edmund von yes. Thurman goes back yes. to Germany and Minen becomes the ambassador. Yes. And then we have this character called Friedrich Wolf, who is, yes. who is the replacement of Niebuhr, right? He doesn't show up until 43. And that's 43, when that's kind of, 43. right. Right. So, but he had um, been in Argentina before. He had he had, he had been yeah, he, an instructor. He a, yeah. But but at some point he was an instructor, uh, yeah, so, yeah. in in the military in the army college here. Yes. Wolf. Yeah. He was he had, he had, he was familiar with Argentina, but part part of Wolf's problem was was that his his wife was actually part Jewish, and so he really wasn't too keen on going back to Germany. He he sort of knew what was going on there. Uh, people had told him, and and at least from what I can, you know, recollect. Uh, so, but yeah. So, in, so, sorry to put this into context. You have the 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 Himmler unit, then you have Canaris and the Aber, and yes. then we have Ribbentrop and the embassy. First with Edmund von Thurman, and then he's replaced by Otto Meinen, who becomes the de facto ambassador yes. until Argentina breaks relations with, with right. Germany at the beginning of 44. And now, why is this base in Argentina so important for the Nazis? Why, why do they need a base in South America for- That, that, that is the $64,000 question. And, 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 and I spent a lot of time digging and, and I think that, that Ronald Newton and, and Yuki Goni are both right. I, I think it was just a prestige thing. Be, you know, the only hint we actually have is a quote from Ribbentrop, where Ribbentrop tells Otto Reinebeck, one of his subordinates, who's the head of, of the Americas and the German foreign ministry, that, you know, we need to we need to maintain our, our position in Argentina sort of for 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 future possibilities. OK, yeah, well, I, I read, uh, you know, yeah. it's interesting because uh, Goebbels, he wrote a diary and uh, I found in his diary an entry in mid-42 uh, in which Joseph Goebbels says, Argentina is going to be very important for us in the future. Can you hear me or have I lost you? Hmm. Esperamos unos minutitos a ver si se... Bueno, ah, se, se cortó la comunicación de él. Está conectado, pero no... Ah, ok, vamos a ver si podemos... Richard, we lost you. Uh... Oh, he's trying to... Está tratando de conectarse. Ok, here we go, again. Uh, As to unmute. Okay, so unmute. Oops. Okay, got it. I think this was sabotage. This was sabotage by the Nazi. The, the Odessa agents still around are trying to sabotage yes. this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, well, okay. you know, because I, I was reading uh, this these diaries by Joseph Goebbels, and he says Argentina mm -hmm. is going to be very important for us in the future. And he says that in '42, and you mentioned this. Yes. Uh, this comment from 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 uh, uh, Ribbon. back, yes. Uh, but and then I, if you read uh, Cordell Hall's mem uh, memoirs of this period, he devotes like hundreds of pages to this issue of Argentina, and he says that a lot of intelligence gathered by the Nazis uh, within their Bolivar network, whatever they call the Red Bolivar or whatever, that that harmed the efforts of the allies in the war and that that you know do you believe that's true or not you don't no no and 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 here's the thing to remember about about hall is that one of the reasons why he focuses on argentina is because that's really the only thing that franklin roosevelt lets him deal with 
you know, Franklin Roosevelt is, is basically the de facto secretary of state as well as the president. He handles his own foreign, foreign policy and, and, and Hull is kind of pushed off to the side. And so, so Argentina is, 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 is kind of his, his plaything. So now this is interesting what you're saying, because we, we started by looking at Germany and how Germany looked at Argentina. And we said in the Eurocentric view that Hitler had and the leaders of the Third Reich had, Argentina was not important. Right. Something that obviously hurts Argentine pride, because we always think that we're very important. But for the Nazi leaders, we were not important. Uh, because they, they had a different view. And then we look at Roosevelt and the United States, the, they, they thought it was important, Argentina was important. And it was important it also to stop the Nazis in Argentina. So, and Argentina starts, when the war starts, um, they initially, uh, the Ortiz government uh, favors a non-belligerent status. Uh, partly because of the famous Battle of the River Plate when the uh, Graf Spe is sunk. Yes. And the Argentines um, basically try to, uh, they, they go to the U.S. government and the British government, they said, you know, we want to adopt non-belligerent status. And Roosevelt said, no, 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 forget it. You know, neutrality. And the Brits actually said, forget about this because we need your beef and we need Argentine ships to be neutral. So forget uh, this non-belligerent status, which, which basically is um, a little bit closer to the allies than being neutral, right? right? But both Roosevelt and Churchill say, forget, no, Churchill was not there yet. Churchill arrives in 41. Uh, but they say, uh, and, that, and that guess was Neville Chamberlain, say, forget about this non-belligerent status you have to remain neutral. Uh, and part of the reason Roosevelt does this because in the US, there's a very strong pro-neutral uh, element, which is uh, under the Republican, uh, in the Republican party and he's facing elections. And so he doesn't want to give anybody a hint that the US wants to go to war and whatever. So Argentina finds itself in a, in a, in a very strange situation because we start uh, we, we suffer the war, actually. It's interesting. I say that in December 1939, a citizen of Buenos Aires was closer to the war than a citizen of Paris or London, because we had the right. Battle of the River Plate right in front of us. But then everything changes in Europe, and um, Germany invades France, and it looks like the war is going to be over, whatever. And the pro-Nazi element here in Argentina becomes very excited because they think, well, Germany is going to win. And so, you know, we should align with Germany. Then we have political changes here. Ortiz is gone. Castillo comes in. And Castillo basically is friendly to the fascist in a way. And he knows that the army, within the army, there's a very strong pro-German element. And so... Castillo starts moving towards a fake neutrality yeah. because already in 42, they're negotiating weapons purchases from, mm -hmm. from Germany, which right. has nothing to do with neutrality. So, so Argentina evolves and with this, this evolution, a lot of things happen in Europe and a lot of things happen in Argentina. And I think sometimes, you know, part of the problem is, uh, Looking at Argentina with the lens of an American historian or Argentines uh, looking at what happens outside of Argentina with a very sort of provincial view, because the war changes very fast. I mean, Germany starts when uh, Churchill comes over. It's it's, it's it seems like the war is going to end in Europe and then things change and and then they change again. And at the beginning of uh, 43 uh, when it's clear that, that in Russia, Hitler is not going to win and they lost uh, Stalingrad and whatever. And then we have a political change in Argentina, which is a very important change, which is the coup d'etat of June 4, 1943. And, and we have the two leaders of that coup d'etat are basically Perón, who had been military attaché in Italy, 39, 40, 
and then Enrique Gonzalez, which is not as well known, obviously, as Perón, but for obvious reasons. But at that time, had the same uh, ranking. I mean, he had the same. Uh, he was. He's also a colonel, and mm-hmm. and he and Perón run this military, this secret society military, the GO, uh, who was behind. And, and Gonzalez had spent time in Nazi Germany as a military attaché. So mm-hmm. they came from the two countries. Um, back to Argentina, and they staged this coup d'etat. And so we have a military government. We have Ramirez. Well, first we have Rawson, who is this guy who basically lasts like 24 hours. They right. kick him because he's pro-ally. They put Ramirez, who had been a, an officer in a German regiment earlier in his career. He was completely uh, pro-Nazi. And I just want to set the stage for... The, the the strange case of Osmar Helmut that you mentioned earlier, because the coup d'etat happens, Ramirez becomes president, and then we have Becker and and some of his right. minions here, right. uh, and this guy Harnish, which we haven't mentioned yet, no. and they have this meeting at the Casa Rosada, which is the, the presidential palace. Can you then connect this with with the, this guy Helmut that you you mentioned at the beginning it was so, like a movie thing. So well, I mean, I, w- I always like to say there's there, there's two tales of Siegfried Becker, right? There's his first trip to, to to South America, which was a complete and utter failure. But then he comes back in January of forty three. Terman is gone. Uh, Niebuhr is gone. You know, so 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 the decks are kind of clear for him. And, and he meets up with, with uh, Hans Harnisch, who's, the head, who's now the new head of the Abwehr Network, um, taking over for Niebuhr. And, and Harnisch is very well connected. He knows all these military officers, right? He knows Pedon. He knows Gonzalez. He knows, uh, uh, what was it, Francisco Filippi, who I think is uh, Ramirez's son-in-law. Filippi, you know, so yes. knows, Right, right. So he knows all these people. And so he starts introducing Becker to them. And trying to figure out, like, well, what does Argentina want, you know, and what, 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 what can we do here? And, of course, what ends up happening is the Argentines keep going back to this arms deal that they kept trying to get. Because they'd gone to the United States in, I think, 1942, and the United States, well, they'd offered them a bunch of obsolete weapons, but the Argentines wanted what the Brazilians had. They wanted the P-51s. They wanted the top-of-the-line material. And the Americans are like, no, we're not going to give it to you. You're, you're too friendly to the Germans. And, and, you know, if you want to come in, we'll give it to you. But, but, and the Argentines are like, no. So, so they well, go there's, the uh, Sorry, there's an interesting exchange between Sumner Wells and the Argentine foreign minister, Rui Gignasu, in, in Rio de Janeiro. And, and at that meeting, after Rui Gignasu basically torpedoes the American proposal, he approaches Wells and says that Argentina wants weapons. And Wells says, yeah. are you Christian? And then yeah. Wells describes, he describes uh, Rui Gignasu as the stupidest person to occupy oh, the foreign yeah. ministry in Argentine I, history. Yeah, they, I mean, they, the, and that's the part that sort of gets me is, is I mean, whatever you want to think about the Americans, at least the Americans are up front about, they're, they're like, if, if you do this, you'll get this. And it just seems like the Argentines just have, they just have way too much pride and, and maybe they just think they're too important. I mean, they understand how important they are to the British, for sure. And, and the British are very clear about that. But, but to the Americans, the Argentines are just kind of like, look, if you want in on this, you, this is what you're going to have to do. And so, so really the only people that are left are the Germans. And, and they had been talking about this, but of course there's, there's, you know, how do you get the weapons to Argentina from Europe? You know, can the Germans even supply them? The, the, the foreign ministry, the, the embassy, cause they go to the embassy first and, and Niebuhr and the embassy are, are, are pretty clear to Argentina that look, you know, you're probably not going to get the stuff that you want, or if you're going to get it, we, we need to wait. You can't get this stuff now. And of course, in 1943, now, now that we have the army in charge, you know, they're very, very f- afraid of Brazil. They're, they're, just, they're just really just, just afraid that the Americans are going to go to Brazil into going to war with them. Yeah, but but this, this, what you just described, doesn't make any sense. Why would Argentina right. be fearful of Brazil and the Americans? Well, that's, right. Well, that's what, that's what, well, let's put it this way. 
that's at least what Becker is telling his superiors in Berlin. Okay, when you read the ultra decrypts, is that the, 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 the Brazilian in the meeting? I think, no, no, but, but, but I, think Becker, I think Becker is saying the right thing. I think the military in Argentina were paranoid. Well, part yes. of the problem is that Argentina thought of itself or the military in Argentina thought of Argentina as the United States of South America. And so they viewed the relationship between Argentina and Brazil as a threat to Argentina's leadership in the continent, which basically existed only in the minds of these military officers because the rest of Latin America didn't consider Argentina yeah. as the, the United States of South America. So there was a lot of confusion on the Argentine side, but um, there is this famous meeting that takes place in mid-July yes. uh, right. 43, and, where right, Harvish, yeah. Well, this is where, so, so there's two, so, so they do go back to the embassy and ask them about weapons. And this is where, where General Wolf is there and Minin are there. And, 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 and the foreign ministry is, is fairly upfront with, with, with them. Look, we're not going to be able to give this stuff to you. Okay. Which is not the right answer, but, and I think here, here's the part that, 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 I mean, it's, it's shocking, but it's not shocking is that the SS is willing to say whatever they need to say. To, to get these people on their side to, to sort of push whatever it is that they want to push. And so when, the, when, when, if the embassy tells them no, well, Harnish works in the embassy. He, he has a desk in the embassy. So he goes to Becker and he's like, well, they just told them no. And so he would, you know, he, you know, radios his superiors in Berlin and, and of course Schellenberg and Pavkin and, and all them are like, sure, we'll give, we'll get, we'll get a weapons. We can do this. And of course, that's what Ramirez and the rest of these people want to hear. Yeah, and actually, course, that, they, they, so, that, so that the audience gets a picture here, there's a meeting in Casa Rosada in which Harnish meets Ramirez. And Ramirez says, listen, we're ready to go into the war if you give us weapons, which is a crazy thing to do. Uh, and, and then they say, how are we going to do this? Because we haven't talked about this, but the Germans communicated with Germany uh, with radio, and they had radio. the Enigma yeah. machine, right? Because yeah. Becker had brought Becker had brought uh, an right. Enigma, right. Machine. so they were communicating, and the, the Germans at that point didn't know that the Brits had basically um, um, deciphered Enigma, yes. and so they they were able to 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 know uh, what was going on. But out of this meeting with with the president. Uh, Ramirez decides to send this man, Osmar Helmut, to, to Germany uh, to, to meet Himmler and to negotiate uh, arms uh, 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 weapons for Argentina. Right. And let me, let me show uh, our audience, I have, I have a document here from I got in the British archives, um, which is um, a very interesting document here. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, uh, but it says most secret here, and it's dated uh, October uh, 13, 43. And, and it says already, we know, we know what's going on. And there's this guy they're sending to Europe to get, to get the weapons. Uh, and that guy was uh, Helmut. I think, I think I have a picture of Helmut. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, so we can, um, well, not no. very, yeah, he's... I can't find it. Um, uh, anyway, um, so Helmut is this guy you were mentioning at the beginning. He's uh, he's yeah. uh, kind of a movie character. Um, yeah, you know. he, he knows. I mean, he knows Harnish. Uh, they 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 they're friends. Um, uh, Helmut is 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 he's he's kind of connected as well. I mean, he had met Ramirez and 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 some of these other people who were involved in the coup on a on a trip to southern Argentina on the train, and they they hit it off, and 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 so so he kind of becomes, at least in their mind, sort of the perfect emissary. And and Helmuth, I think, is one of those people who he wants to feel important. And and you know who's gonna who's gonna turn down the president of their country, right? To to. Yeah to ask him to go somewhere. And I will say this about Helmut. I mean, he, he is a disreputable figure, but when he's even under interrogation by the British, he never really gives up Ramirez and the rest of them. 
even when they kind of present him with the evidence, he 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 stays loyal to 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 them. He's willing to give up Becker and, and, and all the Germans and all the rest of them, but he does stay loyal to them. So maybe that's a point in his favor. Well, but, his only his only chance in, in a way was to to strengthen his Argentine link because the interesting thing with Helmut is that he was sent to Europe under the cover of being a, a diplomat. A diplomat. He, he was right. second right. consul in, in Barcelona, which was not true. And uh, and, and the Brits detain him yes. basically illegally. Uh, illegally, and, yes. So uh, and he's not the only one. There's another Argentine diplomat who they had who they they had they had taken off in Trinidad um like earlier than that. And he's also sitting in Camp 20, which is where they keep all these high value prisoners and and, and interrogate them. Um so I, I the, you know it's like it's it I mean it was a harebrained scheme from the beginning. I, I you know. Because then, you know, then then once 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 the ball gets rolling with this, um, you know, nobody can keep their mouth shut about it. The embassy finds out about it, and 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 they're like, "This is a disaster." They totally know what's going to happen here. Like, if Helmuth gets caught, then 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 Argentina is probably going to break relations, and they're very clear yeah. about this. And they tell they tell. I mean, they go to the to the SS. And they're like, look, this don't do this. This is a bad idea. And of course, they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. And so then, of course, Helmuth gets caught, and everything. And he gets sort of he gets back. threatened. Uh, he gets threatened that he will be he will be hanged if he doesn't yes, and tortured. And 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 I think there was some you know I mean one can sort of how one defines torture. Um, uh, you know, he probably was tortured in that sense. Here's a, here's a document from the British archives as well. Um, they, they showed Helmut a photo of Peron, and Helmut uh, basically confessed that Peron had given him instructions. Uh, yes. This is the original file in the, in the MI5 archives in, in, in the UK. That might have uh, still been classified when I, was, uh, when I went there in 2005. Yeah, now you can actually access uh, this this files uh, almost remotely. But but interestingly, uh, so Helmut gets taken, um, and, and this whole situation unravels, and uh, there's a lot of change in Argentina as a result of it, which is very interesting yes. because um, this gives Peron the opportunity to elbow out Ramirez and uh, and Gonzalez, who are the most pro Nazi. Yes types within the government uh, right. and he, get, he gets rid of them uh, and and he becomes the the, 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 the the basically the guy who runs the government after that after January 44 um, and Argentina is in at that point in in, in, a, in, a, in a bit of a bind because the the, the US uh, breaks relations with Argentina uh, and so uh, and even though Argentina breaks relations with Germany, the, the U.S. ambassador is recalled to Washington, yeah. and uh, and the 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 what do the Germans do after that? What does Becker do after after this Helmut episode blows up? And he well, Becker goes on the run. I mean, the 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 it. What's interesting though, and I mean, and here's sort of the, and I, and I didn't address this though. It's an interesting question. Is is that Becker manages to stay ahead of the police? Because and the FBI is actually very actively pushing the Argentine police to go after him, and I think it was the what was it the Argentine Federal Police who were, who were sort of very pro sort of Nazi whatever. So the FBI was working with the um, what is it the, the 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 Buenos Aires Provincial Police or whatever the province that so the local police to sort of go after Becker, and so Becker is sort of running running Harnish is arrested. Um, his, the, the guy who runs the Bolivar network, uh, Otzinger, who's another interesting character, he's arrested. Um, and, and Becker manages to evade them for, for quite a while. And then finally they get him into prison and it, here's where it gets interesting. They ask Becker to write a statement. You know, tell us everything that you know. Well, Becker makes the mistake of telling them everything that he knows. 
And this is where sort of Perone enters into the picture because even, even later on, I think it was Harnish had talked to Becker and, and Becker had told him that uh, Perone had actually come into the room with him and more or less was like, you need to totally rewrite this statement. Because he, so they, they, yeah, basically they were, they were implicating the regime. Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah, yeah, Becker was implicating everybody. And, and so Becker goes back and he, Becker sort of understands what'll happen if he doesn't do this. I, I think uh, you mentioned in your, him. I think you mentioned in your thesis that uh, the, 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 the book by, um, what was it? Um, that they used the, the, the confession uh, taken in Buenos Aires as, as the truthful confession. Yes, yes. And yeah. it, you know, the truth is right. when they went to the US and they were interrogated, they said, look, we were forced to write, uh, to sign this confession, yeah. but this is not what happened. And so you were able to see the true confession of people yes. like Harnish and Utzinger. Uh, right. But Becker was never taken to the US. Becker went on the run. He was never found. We don't know what happened to Becker. He actually, uh, um, um, Uki Gongi mentions that in his, in his book. Becker actually lived down the street from where he grew up. Because he mentions like that, that he used to walk by the apartment that, 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 that Siegfried Becker lived in. So Becker lives, from what I was able to, to, to sort of figure out, I mean, Becker, Becker lives in Argentina. He stays in Argentina. He never really, I mean, maybe he leaves, but I mean, he dies, I think, in the late 60s or early 70s. But, but we, there, I try to figure out what happened to him, and it's this very scant information about Becker and uh, the, the CIA it, had all these files on him and, and they kind of stop after like 1947 because at that point the Cold War is starting and you know we have bigger fish to fry than Nazis so we're not really concerned with Becker anymore so so that's where it kind of stops so I I had to do a little internet sleuthing and 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 so that that seems to be what I've, I've figured out now he's Another interesting thing you mentioned in your book, uh, the, the, the famous blue book that uh, Spruill Braden yes. published uh, in early 46 to, to sort of influence the election and which totally backfired in Argentina right. because yeah. in a society that was so anti-American and so nationalistic to have a foreigner come in and tell us, you know, what we had to do was such a bad, bad move uh, on on Braden's part, yeah. but anyway, the the blue book was discredited by some historians. I think uh, uh, Newton among them, and and you say in your in your thesis that actually the information in the blue book is is, is quite yeah. Uh, yeah correct. It's correct. You know, so the blue yeah, book is right. is an accurate depiction of what was happening. Well. I, I think the here's the thing. I think the information is correct. I think the interpretation of it is very sort of overdrawn and sort Lantis. of overly sort of negative. You know, yes. they they're not giving any any sort of benefit of the doubt to 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 the Argentines in in, in any sort of way. So and, and and that that is sort of true for the U.S. throughout the whole thing. I mean, they have access to all this information and. You know, what, like when people ask me, they're like, well, what were the Nazis up to in, in Argentina? I'm like kind of everything and nothing. You know, they're, they're no. up to all this stuff, but it's nothing that, that, that would have altered the war in, in any sense of the word. Much ado about nothing. Exactly. It, it, it's at the end of the day, much ado about nothing. And, and so, but, it, but I also defend the United States because I say, when you look at, you know, what Nazi Germany did in Europe, you know, and, and of course, you know, Hull and all the rest of them know what's going on in Europe to the Jews and sort of all these other people, you know, were they really willing to give them the benefit of the doubt? You know, I mean, it was like the United States after 9-11, you know, I mean, with Al Qaeda and sort of everything else. Um, are, are you willing to, 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 to sort of, you know, be the, be the one who's going to let this go? Exactly. And, and that's why, <coughs> you know, I run this, this center for the study of economic history. And at, at first sight, um, the politics of Nazi espionage uh, does not uh, superficially uh, connect with, the, with economic history. But the truth is that as a result of Argentina's links to the Nazis and, and this 
idea of getting weapons in Germany and closing up to, to Nazi criminals after the war and everything, um, the U.S. put Argentina in the doghouse. And in the post-war uh, era, uh, the economic impact on Argentina uh, was huge. Uh, you, you know, I when studying this period, I always say that um, the Second World War was the period of great confusion uh, in Argentina. We sort of picked the loser and we doubled down, even though we, at, you know, by mid-43, it was obvious to most objective observers that it wasn't a matter of if, but of when Germany would be defeated. And in reading Schellenberg's memoirs, uh, I was uh, struck by the fact that Schellenberg and Himmler were already throwing out feelers to, to get some sort of uh, negotiated peace as early as mid 1943, mid you know mid to late 1943. I would I would, I would be I would be skeptical. I I, I mentioned those, those those are documented in the U.S. Oh, files okay. through through Sweden, okay. uh, and in fact. Some people have argued the reason Schellenberg didn't hang at Nuremberg is because um, he could claim that he had tried to to do something. Yeah. About yeah. It. And yeah. I'm not sure it's true or not, but the bottom line is what I'm trying to emphasize is uh, for Argentina, this was a very costly mistake because we were, uh, you know, I when I explained to my students is the U.S. had with Argentina the kind of relationship back then that the U.S. has today with Iran, for example, I mean, or with Venezuela. I mean, we were like, uh, we really uh, uh, suffered as a result of um, choosing the wrong side on this war. And, and there's a speech by Churchill in 19, 1944 in which he says, this is going to have a consequence. You picking the side of Germany is going to have a consequence. And it ended up having a consequence. But um, Richard, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. It's been an hour. Oh, thank you. And yep. I think uh, we could talk about this for a few hours at least because we, we, we barely scratched the surface, as they yes. say. But yeah. I am very interested in getting to uh, getting your work uh, better known in Argentina because I think it's oh, a very you. high quality uh, of work. I think we may, maybe we have a few questions. Uh, that uh, no, we don't have questions from the okay. public, so we have been extremely boring, okay. and, and everybody has fallen asleep, or or we've been very clear and <laughs> left no room for doubt. But uh, I want to encourage uh, everybody who's listening to to download uh, Richard McGaha's uh, thesis from 2009, "The Politics of Nazi Germany in Argentina." Is, is, uh, gives uh, an extremely interesting perspective, not only about espionage, because what we're interested in is how Argentina related to the big powers at the time of the war. So, so Richard, I hope um, I would like to contact you uh, again, because I want to get your guidance and uh, some sources, because one of the sure. projects we have is is to write a book on uh, about Argentina in the Second World War, and I think and that, would, that 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 needs to be done. So certainly, and, and this is an important chapter of that. So I, I will get in touch with you. Uh, yes. Thank you so much, Thanks. and uh, and thank, thank everybody who's been listening. Thank you all. You have a good day.